Good afternoon, everyone. A very warm uh, welcome to all the lovely patients that we had and we have been doing really good. Especially the caregivers and their families, they need to be appreciated a lot because they have probably the biggest contribution to their recovery. So uh, without wasting much of time, I'll start with today's topic. Um, based on the World Stroke Day theme this year, which is to be celebrated on 29th of October next month, it says that if you ever had stroke or if you are one of those who is caring for someone who had stroke, then don't be afraid, don't be alone. We are there to help you. That is the theme that we have. So what exactly is a brain attack? We are probably the first, India's first internationally accredited hospital and we have the latest protocols for all kind of neurological complications. World Stroke Day, as I've already briefed, the theme that we have is hashtag up again after the stroke. Basically, it's focused towards the rehabilitation. So, as I said, stroke caregivers and the patient themselves, they form a team along with the doctors for the betterment of the patient. There has been so many research articles, health analysts who had been studying the amount of money that has been spent by the governments on taking the global data and it shows that projected income, national income loss, stroke happens to be one of the major players in that this maximum financial burden on the country because of stroke and that's why there have been lots of programs to educate the patients more particularly the caregivers so that at the earliest sign of the stroke you should reach to the center where at par excellence is available and necessary actions are put in so what is brain attack we all know about heart attack but do we really know what exactly is stroke and what is a brain attack I often get the question that how does it heal and what kind of stroke is it. So basically brain is something that controls everything. And in the long run, as we have all seen, the patients do tend to do good if the caregivers are really good. As a primary caregiver, that's why we had all of you here with us. Because as a primary caregiver of a stroke survivor patient, in the recovery process, your role is probably the most important and once you or your loved one leaves the hospital the primary responsibility of his or her it switches from the doctor to you that's why it's utmost important that you should know all the details of what you're headed towards so why stroke stroke is the second most important cause of morbidities disabilities and even death in the world and as per the population is aging and the lifestyles are changing stroke is becoming more and more of a health burden on the developed as well as developing countries. It is the second most common cause after the Alzheimer's disease to have memory loss. There's something called post-stroke dementia. We have done a study in our setup only. We have found that almost 72% of the patient have some form of post-stroke memory disturbances. So cost of the stroke is enormous, gigantic in the given setup. And the cost, we just compared the American, uh, the expenditure on it and the cost, the, uh, it causes almost 30 billion per year and per patient it's been going up only. Uh, so is the case with India. In fact, the number of patients are more with us, that's where the cost burden is even more. And uh, the life expectancy is increasing day by day. The modalities to diagnose and treat the stroke is also better than what we had earlier. That's why um, there has been some increase in the detection of the stroke and the longevity of the patient has been more. But as per the very conservative estimate, there are about 400 cases of stroke per 1 lakh population in a given time. That's quite a bigger number. So lessons from the West, what we have learned is actually the stroke deaths and disabilities are decreasing. Why so? As I just explained, this improved healthcare, good preventive uh, care and this awareness amongst the lay, lay public and the caregivers. That is exactly why we have you all with us. We want you to spread the word and as the, spread, the word spreads, there would be probably lives you would be saving ultimately. So public awareness is the key. One should know yourself, take on the healthy way of the life. Spreading the message is very important. 
brain tag is not just a single disease it's basically due to blockade of a vessel in the brain that could be a clot or ischemic stroke but if it is due to bleeding or bursting of a blood vessel in the brain that's a hemorrhagic form of stroke which is secondary to a brain hemorrhage i'll explain in details this is basically a brain that we have we have lots of chambers in the brain and all these chambers they have got particular functioning they have particular names i'll be coming to that if we focus on it we have parietal lobe frontal lobe temporal lobe occipital lobe there's a small brain that we call as cerebellum the spinal cord brain stem is the area which is very vital so depending on what location the patient is having this stroke his symptoms would differ and accordingly the prognosis and overall recovery would differ as well by and large is the left side of the brain which is considered to be the dominant brain so in almost 90% of the individuals if somebody has a stroke of the left side of the brain he would be having a worse prognosis compared to the one who has on the right side so uh, this is how the brain actually looks like as we see from heart the blood vessels they traverse all the way through the neck into the brain and that's why one of the most common reason for having a brain attack is that probably your heart is not doing good if your heart is throwing away some form of clot they may immediately reach to the blood vessels inside the brain and that is one of the most common cause for having ischemic stroke okay and as we see there are some this yellowish part that is basically the cholesterol and the fat that we have inside our blood vessels so as we have a healthy diet every day we don't realize it but every day we keep depositing some form of lipids inside our vessels not just the heart but also the brain vessels and ultimately there comes a stage when we form a clot there which get dislodged and we are at the risk of developing a stroke now focusing more on to it the blood vessels they have a particular anatomy inside the brain they are mostly three important arteries we have aca mca and pca brain stroke differ accordingly and this is the mid section of the brain as we see every artery has a feeder till the end part of the brain even the distal part if it gets blocked you can have infarct anywhere in the brain so even the slightest of impairment of the blood in the brain should be taken seriously so what are the clots and what are the uh, different forms of stroke basically as we see the blood vessel here is blocked by this yellowish plaque which is causing the blood to clot and that clot is blocking the further area which that area is being blocked from the blood supply that it has been receiving earlier so if this area is not getting the proper nutrients it needs in the form of oxygen in the form of glucose in the form of vital nutrients that it needs it's bound to go dead and brain is one part where once the tissue die they don't usually come back other parts of the body they have ability to grow back but brain <coughs> there has been newer therapies regarding neuroplasticity but uh, it's still in the research so that's how a brain clot would affect and when you actually look at the brain this is how it would differ if this is a normal brain this is the brain of somebody who have had a clot so uh, and most likely they do come from the heart so um, or secondary to atherosclerotic plaque as we see the whole process you know it doesn't happen overnight as it is usually projected when somebody has a stroke we think something went wrong yesterday or day before only it's not that way right now even we are forming some form of lipids inside our body they tend to get deposited inside the blood vessels and this is how it starts and then it keeps increasing in size once there's some rough area that is formed the blood tends to get attached to that part and it forms a thrombus a thrombus is basically a bigger clot of blood and when this part of the blood is fragmented it leaves away a small part of it that traverses along the blood vessels and that is called embolism that leads to the brain stroke so the process is not really as acute as we think it's a gradual process that builds up over every month every year so coming to the brain hemorrhage part there is a different kind of stroke in which we have a bleeder inside the brain 
there is extravasation of the blood from the blood vessels as we see this patient had bleeding in this particular area so the reason for this could be different forms of locations are there hypertension or subarachnoid hemorrhage there could be some aneurysm sort of a ballooned out vessel that would be lying already in your brain which you often goes undiagnosed some date ruptures that can lead to the like these are the aneurysms which are often not diagnosed because patient may not have symptoms other than headache so all of a sudden one day this may rupture and patient may have a brain hemorrhage that's why uh, what are the different causes for uh, having this clots or the hemorrhages basically it's a devil that has many faces it comes from all the risk factors that we have the most important being hypertension which is very often ignored patients of hypertension they just think about i have hypertension i take my medicines but lifestyle modification becomes very important controlling blood pressure itself may not just help smoking often neglected smoking contributes in a really large way to formation of all the clots and then it leads to the stroke lipid abnormalities the deposition of that white material that we saw diabetes a very important factor obesity contributes in all the forms obesity obesity in itself can lead to hypertension diabetes dyslipidemia that's called metabolic syndrome in which you have all forms of new age metabolic problems which probably the people uh, in 1900 or 1800 didn't have as many as we have these days all due to the lifestyle and the kind of diet that we have so other risk factors the previous strokes and the mini strokes mini stroke basically is something which didn't appear on the mri or it recovered on its own it's called transient ischemic attack but it needs to be taken seriously sometimes what happens patient tends to get some weakness of the hand or maybe speech difficulty but it recovers within 30 minutes 20 minutes and they tend to forget about it which is probably a ghastly mistake to do one must consider a consultation with doctor so that it's looked into was there any temporary mini stroke that the patient had and the causes should be looked into diseases of the blood vessels and the legs sedentary habits as we are progressing towards the 21st century and 22nd our lifestyles have become more and more sedentary so uh, that is contributing in a large way if one is having bad headaches drug addicts heavy alcohol and ocps also may at times contribute now with this risk factors particularly hypertension the american heart association has suggested guidelines for it we have the medications for it but it tends to be diagnosed when patient has two consecutive blood pressure readings which are taken on two different days and they are on the higher side just one single reading is not enough but even after two sing- uh, two readings it's on the higher side one should recheck with four such readings that's why the follow up with the doctor becomes very important and usually up to the age of 55 men tend to have naturally a higher form of uh, blood pressure compared to the female population but after the age of 55 they both are at the equal risk of having hypertension so significance is it's a treatable independent risk factor if you keep your blood pressure under check it helps largely for example there was a trial that showed if you keep your diastolic blood pressure less than like uh, if you reduce it by 7.5% or let's say if this increase by 7.5% uh, 7.5 mmhg then this 46% increase in the stroke risk that you would be having so let's say somebody you ha- uh, had blood pressure around uh, 140 by 90 and all of a sudden he is having it into 150 by 98 so roughly he has 8 mmhg increase in his diastolic blood pressure which may not sound really a big deal but if it remains like this he may have almost 46% higher risk of developing stroke than the other population and bp above 160 by 90 if it remains consecutively like this then you are at risk by four times more compared to what the other population group with non hypertensive population would have so making the diagnosis is very important and once it's clinically uh, seen then you should look for the end organ damage like not just the blood pressure monitoring but you need to get your fundus checked if there is any eye changes or uh, you should do ecg to look for is it secondary to a heart issue and echocardiogram 
often at times can give us a lot of information particularly in the patient of stroke there's a condition called atrial fibrillation in which the heart starts beating irregularly and that is only seen on the ECG or the uh, elongated loop recorders or holter that we have and uh, echo can give us information if there's any source for cardioembolic stroke when the stroke is traversing to the brain do we have any measure that can be corrected that can be seen with the echo now the treatment the primary prevention in the form of lifestyle modification the secondary prevention uh, in the form of antihypertensive should be considered but how do we control the blood pressure obviously with the medications but on top of that one needs to reduce the salt intake in a moderate amount you need not make it zero at times patient with hypertension tend to have zero sodium intake and they land up with hyponatremia which is very severe if you have very low sodium in your brain it's gonna cause problems then uh, you have to lose some weight then you can increase the fish oil intake alcohol smoking needs to be given away and obviously there are a lot of guidelines for the medications for hypertension which you should consult a doctor and then go for it how well is the hypertension controlled um, usually it's not so well controlled patients don't know about their status 30% don't even know if they have hypertension they never check for it 34% are on the medications and they are well controlled so this is the only group 34% that we are happy with but 25% are on the medications but they are not very well controlled either the drug compliance is not good or they need to change their treatment 11% are not on any medication even though they are told that you are a hypertensive patient and you should take medication so that's why you should pay more attention to the control of blood pressure now diabetes is also important factor diet and exercise and oral hypoglycemic drugs with that we have insulin that helps it continues to increase the risk around uh, prevalence is around 7% in age adjusted adults and more common in the Indian subcontinent 90% of the diabetic patient they have type 2 form of diabetes which is um, the form of diabetes that develops probably later in the life and it's not so insulin dependent while uh, the rest type 1 is totally insulin dependent form of it 40% 40, 40 of the people of the age above 40 they tend to have pre-diabetic status and even that is a risk factor for developing stroke so uh, aggressive management we should be focusing on the uh, if the patient has prior stroke or hyperlipidemia or has heart disease diabetes hypertension then a special precaution should be given that we should look for the additional risk factors and prognosis may just be not as good as with those who don't have these conditions so reducing the risk of stroke by modifying the lifestyle most important is the smoking cessation many patients they know that smoking is not good for health they probably tend to relate it to the lung cancer and the other forms of chest infection but the contribution in the form of stroke the cardiovascular risk they are often ignored so all people who smoke should be encouraged to stop it and that needs proper counseling and sometimes if needed there are medications available these days uh, obesity exercise and diet modification is also very important now uh, what happens how do we know a patient is having stroke it's like there is a algorithm for that there is a mnemonic uh, fast face arm then the speech and time if you have your neighbor or somebody else who is having difficulty in speaking or he is having drooping of the uh, mouth to the one side or the patient is having weakness of the arm or there is any facial deviation to one side then these criteria can help you know that patient is probably having stroke and that's why the T part of the FAST campaign is time the time is very important the moment you notice that the patient is having stroke it's utmost important that you take him to the center where stroke excellent care is available because if you take the patient to the hospital within three hours preferably at least in 4.5 hours then there's a miraculous wonder drug that sir has already mentioned it's called intravenous thrombolysis IVTPA if you could take the patient to the hospital within time limit of 4 to 4.5 hours 
that injection could be given and whatever damage the clot is doing could be stopped with that injection because it dissolves it which has DSA lab and a very experienced neurointerventional radiologist like we have here we are fortunate enough to have the center like that um, that's why the new trial suggests that even if it's up to 16 hours or even 24 hours that the patient have had weakness still there is something that can be done about it so um, the risk factors by and large are sedentary habits, obesity, the alcohol, smoking, previous TIAs, high blood pressure, cholesterol and the sugar itself and of course the major player is the heart. This is some form of uh, cardioembolic source is often always seen. So the treatment is you have to consult an expert as soon as possible. Remember time is the brain. Prevention is better than the cure and do not neglect the usual or persistent symptoms which are often neglected. Rush to the hospital when you develop neurological symptoms of stroke without wasting any time whatsoever. So time is the brain, clot can be lysed and clot can also be pulled out as I just mentioned and hemorrhage can be evacuated if there is bleed inside the brain, it can be operated upon and it can be removed. In case of ruptured aneurysm, it can also be coiled and clipped. So there are different forms of uh, treatment which are available depending on the type of the stroke that the patient has. So um, now as a caregiver, the National Stroke Association and overall the World Stroke uh, Day uh, theme focuses on some important points. There are 10 tips for the caregivers to focus on. One has to accept that you cannot do this alone. It's not just the caregiver or the family who can handle it. It's the whole team that needs to deal with the menace called stroke. You need to educate yourself. The purpose why we have you here is to educate you and to spread the word. Allow yourself to grieve. At times the morbidity is so stressing that you get very depressed and stressed with it. But once you know that it may not just be a permanent thing, you need to, you are allowed to grieve a bit, but then you need to move on. You need to learn to relax because unless the caregiver is okay with the part of that life, the patient who is suffering from stroke itself won't be feeling good. If he is feeling like he is a burden on the family, he won't really be good. So you need to relax yourself. You need to make him feel good. You need to eat well and keep yourself uh, in the phase where you can keep on giving your care. You need to stay active, daily exercises, you need to have fun. Staying social is very important. At times when somebody develops stroke, he keeps himself isolated. Maybe it could be the facial deformity or overall uh, the morbidity that the patient is having. But one needs to tell him, one needs to educate him and you need to promote his social interactions. Because uh, since the olden ages is the social behavior of human beings that has been uh, giving us the energy and enthusiasm to keep progressing. The same works with stroke. Uh, finding a caregiver support group, exactly the purpose again why we have you here. If we have a group in which you have different patient, different ethnicity, different uh, morbidities and severity of stroke, you can discuss your problems, you can have support and that way you won't be left alone. Take things one day at a time because this is a very common question that we get on the first day of the stroke itself. How long will it take for him to walk? How long will it take for the patient to move the legs or all sort of question. One needs to have patience and we need to focus on the short targets. Initially just focus on a day, then take it week by week, but you need to live in the presence. You can't just be coming up with the questions like when would things happen? It takes time, but depends on the type of stroke that the patient has. So you have to take things one day at a time because future is very uncertain. Now uh, we have had uh, a new form of technology called telemedicine in our department here in which emergency stroke mobile units are being set up in which uh, if the patient is not able to come to the hospital, we are bringing the hospital to the patient. Now it works with a very good form of mobile stroke unit in which we have an ambulance that has basic necessities in the form of CT scan, emergency physician and a neuroradiologist or neurologist who is connected through telemedicine who can immediately look at the symptoms, diagnose the patient with stroke and within that window of 4 to 4.5 hours we 
may be able to give the patient IVTPA on the site at the home itself and then we can bring the patient back to the hospital and it's a very well equipped ambulance basically it has a portable CT scanner and a roll up IVTP uh, administration is already there a terrier radiology and terrier neurology connections are important for making it a fruitful plan so care in expert hands in the form of stroke unit with medications the nursing and rehabilitation of which all the parts they have their own importance we'll be dealing with the rehabilitation part in the next lecture itself so thank you all and i hope you understood the message that i wanted to convey